Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the second week of our lecture on the history of Western thought, why we think the way we do. Uh, first, um, we have a number of questions about where you can find the video of the last lecture, plus videos of a lot of the previous lectures that I've done, the series. Uh, last time I did a series on world religions, and then there are a series on various aspects of the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, all of those are in the same place. If you go to our Lakeside Institute of Theology website, which is www.litchapala.org, LIT stands for Lakeside Institute of Theology, it's the theological training center we have here. So litchapala.org, and then along the top there are a number of different tabs. If you click on the one called Eight Week Series, you can, the, the last series that I did on world religions, and this one is there. There's also a tab called Windstar Talks, which are lectures that I gave on board ship uh, for one of the cruise lines. So you can pick up on that. If anybody has any questions, you know, please let me know, but you should be able to find all the information at that location. Okay. This is the agenda for our lecture series. Last week we talked, we did an introduction and then talked about faith because we talked about philosophers that came from the, the age of faith, as it was called. And I'm going to talk about those again in just a minute. Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, and Aquinas, just to bring us up to speed for where we are this week. Today we're going to talk about the age of reason, which we began with a French philosopher named René Descartes. And the, so today we're going to talk about Descartes, John Locke, and David Hume. So we got a Frenchman, an Englishman, and a Scotsman. Um, next week, experience and then process. We have no lecture on September 9th. Carolyn and I are in Wisconsin for her father's 104th birthday party. And the 16th, we will talk about will, 23rd, meaning and meaninglessness, and then uh, we'll do a, a wrap-up and conclusion on the 30th. Any questions about any of that? Again, our point here is to look at how we came to think as a Western culture. Many of the things that we take for granted today are actually things that somebody thought up of at one time. And yet we've reached the point where many of us think, well, the way I see my worldview, the way I see the world and my place in it, the way I understand life is just common sense. Anybody who's got any brains will agree with me. And I think it's important and helpful for us to start thinking about where do many of the ideas that we take for granted come from? And that's sort of the focus in our series here. Uh, I'm not dealing in any sense with all of the philosophers of Western culture. At first, I'm not dealing with any of the Western I'm not going to get into Eastern philosophy. But I just picked the Western philosophers that I think most directly can be seen as affecting the modern way of thinking. Now, last week, we dealt with the first four of these. Um, Plato, on the left-hand side, you can see here. And then, following him, his student, Aristotle, and then, later still, we get St. Augustine, who really followed the, the patterns first developed by Plato. And then, much later, um, 900 years later, Thomas Aquinas followed in Aristotle's footsteps. Now, the reason I lined them up like this, and this is going to be very much how we're going to talk about it, there are, in the, the broadest possible sense, there are two major ways of thinking about what is real. On the left-hand side, I call that idealism, and I've said that this reflects the mathematicians and poets. Plato, and then later Augustine, who is one of the great church fathers, they believed that the, the most real things were things that were abstract, to use a philosophical terms, things that are a priori, which means come before. Before you have any sense experience, there are certain things that are true. Plato said that the form, the ideal form of things, how do we know that everything from a beanbag chair to a stool to one of these blue chairs and etc. that they're all chairs? Because there's some ideal form of a chair that existed before there were any physical sense evidence. So Plato developed this idea of the form or the ideals which he believed were in the mind of God. Aristotle came along and disagreed with it. He said there is nothing real other than the, the material world, the sense experience we have of the things in the physical world. So Plato believed the most real things were not physical. Aristotle felt that they were. Later on, Augustine comes along and, and follows Plato's lead and said that the real truth comes before and apart from any physical senses, any seeing, hearing, etc. And if you think about it, you, we have different people have different views. If you, how many, anybody from Missouri? 
Can you tell me what Missouri's state slogan is? Show me. Show me. It's the show me state. Missourians are supposed to be not willing to take anything just on your word or assume anything. They have to be shown. Now, who would they agree with most? Plato or Aristotle? Aristotle. Aristotle, because Aristotle said you have to sense, experience things with your senses, like seeing them, in order for it to be real to you. Augustine comes along and agrees with Aristotle and says that faith comes before reason. The internal comes before the external. St. Augustine came along 900 years after that and said, no, reason, based upon our experience of the sensual world, comes first, and because of reason, we then come to faith. They were almost the opposites. So on the one hand, you get the non-physical ideals, that's why it's called idealism, uh, as the highest reality. On the other side, the physical world brings us, uh, is the source of the highest reality. On the one hand, you have mathematicians, because mathematics is an abstract form. Mathematics occurs, have you ever wondered how Einstein and various other great mathematicians have been able to prove these cosmological truths about gravity and everything? All, it's all in their head. Things that they cannot prove in the physical world, because mathematics is an abstract form. It occurs internally more than externally, and then you prove it in the external world. Whereas mathematicians and poets are idealists following Plato and Augustine, scientists and politicians are materialists. They deal with the physical world and our sense experience. And Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas were two of the great thinkers in that mode. And as I said last week, interestingly, Augustine is seen as sort of the original patron saint of Protestantism because the Protestant reformers rediscovered Arist uh, uh, excuse me, Plato through Augustine. And the Catholic Church looks to St. Thomas Aquinas as the source of Catholic doctrine. So the differences here are reflected in the differences in Protestantism and Catholicism. Another way of understanding that these things really do have an effect in how we understand the world. Okay? So that's from last week. That's all prophets. Now, to, before we get into the three philosophers I'm going to talk about today, and how they related to what came before and how they set up what comes later. I want to introduce you to some isms. You know, isms. They're the, 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 and I don't expect you to remember all these. If one or two of them strike you and you remember what they mean, that's great. But this will be helpful as we go along because you will, you'll be able to remember them, think back to them. First, idealism. I've already talked about it. Plato was an idealist. Idealism is the belief that reality, or at least reality as we can know it, is mental, it's mentally constructed, or it's otherwise immaterial, it's abstract, it comes before sense experience. That's idealism. The second one is, whoops, is materialism, represented by, whereas Plato and Augustine represent idealism, Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas represent mater materialism, that's reliance on experience of the physical or material world alone as the basis for determining what is real. You remember last week I said the three great questions that we have trouble uh, answering anymore to anyone's satisfaction is what is real, what is true, what is good. Idealism and materialism represent the two primary different ways people have decided to interpret what is real. Is it more real what happens inside? Or is it more real what's happening outside? If you come from Missouri, it's what happens outside that's more real. Show me. I want to see it. I have to experience it with my senses. We then have relativism. Relativism is the belief that truths, especially ethical truths, here we get to the second question, what is true? That truths, especially ethical truths, change depending upon the individual or groups holding them. Today you will find people say, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. That is relativism. That what is true, and that's a very new idea, by the way, for most of human history, the idea was there are certain things that are, that are true. Whether you like it or not, whether you agree with them or not, they're true or they're not true. Believing that that's conditional upon the situation and upon the person thinking about it, that's relativism. The fourth one is subjectivism. Subjectivism is the belief that individual feeling or thought is the ultimate criteria for what is real, true, and good. Well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. That's subjectivism. I decide what is true for me. That's, I am the subject. So subjectivism means truth is based upon what I decide it is, not something external to me. 
Next we have rationalism. Rationalism is the reliance on reason alone as the basis for establishing truth or value. Doesn't matter what you feel, doesn't matter what you believe, it matters what you think or how you think. Rationalism means the brain is the only appropriate organ for accessing truth. And we have very much gotten to that place in our culture. We, we've gone past the... Now, rationalism is not the same as being rational. Being rational is a good thing. That is making sense of things. But rationalism means that's all you rely on, is your reason, rationality. We'll get into some of that later. Next, we have sensualism. That is the persistent and excessive pursuit of sensual or experiential pleasures and interests. We have whole schools of Greek philosophy that, that focused on this. Okay, Epicureanism, for instance. Hedonism. Hedonism today means to us, you know, a following of pleasure. Well, it actually was a school of philosophical thought that, that said pleasure is the highest of all philosophical truth. So sensualism. Human progress and perfectibility. I could call this progressivism, but, you know, so that it's got an ism in there. But this means the belief that humanity is continually evolving into better and higher states of being. That we today are smarter and better, maybe more ethical, more handsome, taller, whatever it is. That we're getting better and better. Every day in every way I'm getting better and better. People who believe that about the human race, that we are inherently better than those who came before, they believe in the idea of progressivism, or human progress and perfectibility. That, well, you know, what we believe today has to be better than what Plato thought, okay? Some of you believe that isn't, isn't really aware of what they believe, and they certainly haven't read Plato. As Whitehead, uh, Alfred North Whitehead said, everything since Plato has simply been a footnote to what he had to say. We then get commercialism. Commercialism is an overemphasis on material goods or economic benefits. He who dies with the most toys wins, right? And whether we are, will articulate that or not, the idea that the value of my life is based upon how much power I have, how big a position I have, how much money I make, how big a house I have, how fast a car I drive. Folks, that's our culture. And this is a commercialism in terms of a philosophical approach. And then finally, <coughs> sorry this is out of hand, nihilism. You know, anytime you say nihilism, Frederick Nietzsche's uh, should come to mind. Nihilism is a belief that traditional values and beliefs are unfounded, that existence is senseless and useless. Nihilism is another word for despair. And that is the predominant philosophical attitude over the last 30 years. And we'll talk about that when we get there, okay? I don't expect you to memorize these, but I think just getting an exposure to them will help you sort of relate to some of the things we're going to talk about. Any questions about that? Are you okay with that? You understand some of the isms? Yes? Well, you can't say one person started it. Um, there, we'll talk about that a little bit today. Nihilism is a product of radical skepticism. And much of radical skepticism actually did begin with one of the philosophers we're going to talk about, the third one, David Hume. And so we'll talk about that. It, it got refined under Nietzsche in terms of his specific philosophy. And, late, and then later on, under Derrida, the most modern idea, philosophical idea, is that you cannot find, not, not what is true, or is it true, but there is no truth, there is no meaning, there is no purpose, there is no nothing. And this really became part of deconstruction under Jacques Derrida. And we'll talk about him in a few weeks, okay? All right, today I want to introduce you to three philosophers. The first one is a Frenchman. We forgive him for that. Because he was a great thinker, a great man, René Descartes. He was French, he lived at the end of the 16th and start of the 17th century. And he was a jack of all trades and a master of most of them. He was a mathematician. How many of you all ever had a geometry class? Do you remember the X and Y coordinates? X is the horizontal line, Y is the vertical line. It's, a, it's intended for you to be able to plot any point in space according to the coordinates. You know, x2, y4 gives you a point in the graph. He came up with that. That's called Cartesian coordinates from Descartes. Cartesian is a Latinized version of Descartes. He was uh, a mathematical genius. He created uh, analytical geometry. And you also remember from back in your school days, Analytical geometry is the thing that connects algebra to geometry. You remember quadratic equations? x squared plus y times da da da, da. 
so that you then can plot that on a graph? You have to thank him for all those classes you had to sit in about that. So he invented Cartesian coordinates. He was a significant mathematician, especially in geometry. As a scientist, he contributed to physiology, optics, and geometry. As a philosopher, he is considered the founder of modern philosophy. Everything prior to him we consider almost ancient philosophy, including Augustine and Aquinas. But in the end of the 16th and first of the 17th century, uh, René Descartes invented modern philosophy. He invented the modern scientific method. And I'll explain how that is in a minute. The way all science is done today started with him. He also started what's considered the age of reason, or the modern age. The age of reason is how this, you know, what today's class is called reason. Because whereas previously we talked about people who lived in the age of faith, it was called, this is the age of reason, starting with René Descartes. He was a trained scholastic. Scholasticism was the high academic programs that Thomas Aquinas was a part of. These, these academics that would write 5,000 page, you know, five volume books about theological issues. Again, arguing things like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin and why do we think that? While he was trained as a scholastic, Descartes rejected that. He was a skeptical Catholic. On the one hand, he believed in God, and he, he accepted two different arguments for God. I'll mention in a second. But he also believed that you could explain the existence of the universe in entirely scientific, mechanistic kind of uh, ways. Which means he was the one who laid the groundwork for people to be willing to accept what Darwin says later, and what other scientists said later, in terms of how the world came to be. He laid the groundwork for that. You begin to see how important Descartes was. Now, some of his key thoughts. He, because he was a mathematician first, he applied inductive science and math principles to physical phenomena and to philosophy. He is perhaps best known for introducing a radical skepticism uh, with cognito ergo sum. Why it's called uh, radical skepticism? Cognito ergo sum means, I think, therefore I am. Descartes, in inventing the scientific process, he said, Okay, what can I know for sure? And he said, well, I can't be sure that my senses are telling me the truth. I can't even be sure that my mind is telling me the truth about what I perceive. He, and he presents this picture. He says, suppose a powerful, evil, spiritual being is trying to fool me into believing something is real when it's not. Think about the Matrix movie. Did you see the Matrix? That basically was a movie version where people think they're living their real life and they're going about their life, but in fact, they're all in suspended animation and this is all just a computer construct. Well, Descartes, without knowing about computers or virtual reality, he said, what if a spiritual, an evil spiritual being was convincing me that all this stuff is true when it's not? What is... And he introduced the idea of doubt, doubting everything. I can doubt my, I have to doubt my senses, I have to doubt my perceptions, I have to doubt my rationality. And he kept taking things away from what he could be sure of until he boiled it down to the fact, well, the only thing I absolutely can be sure of and that I can't doubt is that I must exist or I wouldn't be thinking about this. <laughs> I, I could not ask this question about what is real if I didn't actually exist. So I think... Cognito, therefore I am, ergo sum. This is Latin, because everybody in scholarly world wrote in Latin back then. So he was saying, even if everything else cannot be proven, if everything else should be doubted, the one thing I cannot doubt is that I think, therefore I am. Now the consequences of that are very significant. I think, therefore I am. I, do you see the subjectivism? It's not what somebody else thinks, not what somebody else tells me, not what some other source said. I, so there's a radical subjectivism in that. It's all about me. I think, therefore the focus is on rationality. It's not, I feel, therefore I am. I love, therefore I am. I, you know, argue, therefore I am. I have to eat, therefore I am. It's rationality, or rationalism, not rationality, rationalism. I think, therefore, I am. All existence is based upon my perceptions, and it's based upon my rational perceptions. So he argued that the only reliable 
Bible's source for knowing what was real was rationalism, the mind. Everything else can be doubted. You see that? Can you see how the modern, sort of self-absorbed world that we live in in the West began with the idea that it's what I think and my very existence is dependent upon my, my rationality. This was the platform on which all modern thinking occurred. That's why he is called the father of modern philosophy, uh, the father of modern skeptical thought, or the, the scientific method. Um, because the scientific method today starts out with not assuming anything, right? You doubt everything, and then you do experimentation, and the experiment has to prove something is a fact before you accept it. Descartes is the one who invented that. Doubt everything until you can prove it. And in the case of philosophy, he said the only thing I can prove is I must exist because I'm thinking about existing. In fact, and I'll, this may be a little, a little bit too much for you, but in, in philosophy and in a number of different academic disciplines, there is what's called the principle of falsification. If I look at that chair, there are a hundred things I can tell you about that chair that, is tr that are true. Right? Proving that something is true doesn't really prove the existence of something. It doesn't really prove anything at all because there could be more things that are true and more things that are true. But if I can find one thing that's false about that chair, if I say that chair is in the Choakon, it's not here, then one false proof is more important in terms of philosophy than 10,000 true proofs. And so philosophy, since Descartes, has based itself on what's called the principle of falsification. In fact, a lot of science does. If you can find one false about a theorem in science, then that proves it's not true. But you compare that, you can prove any number of things that are true and still not prove anything. Did I, did I lose you on that one? <laughs> Descartes started that, saying, doubt everything, and then boil it down to only the things you can prove. Um, he introduced strict dualism, mind versus matter. Uh, the idea that these are distinct things, that they're not, um, he didn't agree with Aristotle that your perception of something is what that gives reality. He said, no, there, there are things in the world and there are your, your perception of things in the world. And those are not the same thing. So he made a division between the internal and the external. And he said the internal was more important. I think, therefore I am. Not, I can touch something, therefore I am. And then he argued for God's existence. He had two arguments. Again, this shows his internal focus. One of them was the ontological argument with St. Anselm of Canterbury had come up with. The argument that the very fact that we can conceive of a supreme, perfect being, there must be one. I'm not going to get into the ontological argument. It is of all the arguments for the existence of God, the one is hardest to understand. But he also coined what uh, Descartes coined what he called the trademark argument for God. That the very fact that I can conceive of God means somebody must have given me that idea because I'm a finite creature. I couldn't even come up with that idea. So God must have given me that idea. Therefore, I'm carrying the trademark of God. So he argued from mental processes for the existence of God, from rationality, not from any other external proof. Nothing about design or anything like that. In terms of long-term impact, as I said, he started the modern age. He invented modern scientific method. He contributed to modern philosophy, in fact, as the father of modern philosophy with idealism, rationalism, and skepticism, doubt everything, along with modern belief in the complete separation of mind and matter, which he called the Cartesian dualism, mind, matter, separate, not intertwined like Aristotle thought they were, and a purely mechanistic view of the universe, the idea that the world could have come about purely by mechanistic form without God having to do anything. This is Descartes, and again, the point here is, he introduced a radical subjectivism, I think, the fact that it's a radical rationalism, it's because I think I exist, and a skepticism, doubt everything until you can prove it. That was not how the world thought before Descartes. There were certain things that were assumed by everybody to be true. So he fundamentally changed the rules. And I think we can see things today that directly relate back to that. Do you have a question? Oh, I thought somebody raised their hand. Okay. Any questions about Descartes and the significance? This stuff, some of it's not easy. It wouldn't really be important if it were easy. 
I want to give you a quote, and again, this is in the context of Descartes is talking about if he were being tricked into believing things by a malicious spirit, how could he prove, you know, what's the, what's the most he could prove being real without being tricked by the spirit? And he writes this, I've edited pieces out of this. Um, he writes, then examining attentively what I was, he's talking about the process, examining attentively what I was, from the very fact that I thought of doubting the truth of things, it followed very evidently and very certainly that I existed. If I didn't exist, I couldn't doubt. This I, that is to say the mind, notice the focus on the mind, rationalism, not the body, not the feelings. The, this I, that is to say the mind by which I am what I am is distinct entirely from the body. This is the Cartesian dualism, mind and matter. And even that is easier to know than the body. And moreover, that even if the body were not, it would not cease to be all that it is. The mind is more important. The mind is the source of more reality than the body, than the physical world. That's why he's Plato. On Plato's side, not on Aristotle's side. And having noticed that there is nothing at all in this, I think, therefore I am, which assures me that I am speaking the truth, except that I see very clearly that in order to think, one must exist. Do you see that argument? Now, the idea that if I doubt everything else, at least I must be existing, or I wouldn't be able to think about existing, makes common sense. But when you break that down into the subjectivism, it's about what I think, the rationalism, it's thinking, not something else. These are fundamental in terms of leading the way into the modern world in our way of thinking today. Okay? Any questions about Descartes? Yes. Yes. Did he believe in an afterlife? Well, he was a skeptical Catholic, so probably he would have said, yes, I believe in an afterlife, but I'm not real sure about it. He did believe in God. I mean, he, he developed, he, he accepted Ansel's argument for God, but then he developed one of his own. How did he define God? Well, I don't know. I mean, he and I haven't talked about that. Um, so he, he assumed the existence of God, but obviously he had a different idea about it because he believed that it's possible God didn't have to have created the world. At this point, he didn't say God didn't create the world. He said it's possible that God wouldn't have had to create the world. It might have come across by purely mechanistic, you know, meaning just the happenstance of things, um, which I, I believe is one of the dumbest things Descartes could have said, by the way, myself. Um, I don't think there are reasonable mechanistic answers for how the world came to be, um, but that's another class. I now want to talk to you about something else, somebody else rather, John Locke, an Englishman. Um, a number of these philosophers clearly, uh, you know, you figure when they make a portrait, they're going to make them look as good as they can, right? <laughs> Well, some of the, if you think John Locke doesn't look so good in this portrait, wait till you see Hegel. <laughs> uh, but John Locke was English. Uh, he came after Descartes from the late, later 17th century up until early 18th century. And he was uh, a philosopher. He was the founder of what's called empiricism. Empiricism, which is seen as the basis of the scientific method now, is entirely a focus on the physical world and our sense perception that reality is us perceiving the material or physical world. And that obviously is what science does. It perceives evidence from experimentation of the physical world in creating the scientific method. Now, he also was a political theorist. He wrote a lot about politics. In fact, John Locke was significantly responsible for a lot of the concepts which we sort of take for granted as being part of our Declaration of Independence in the United States and our Constitution. John Locke greatly influenced a number of other people, and it was he who kind of created this idea of a democratic republic that we wrote into the governmental style of form that we have in the United States. So we can look to the Englishman John Locke for some of that original political theory. Now, you will notice on several of these people that they were philosophers, but they were also scientists, and they were also politicians. It's a very modern idea that these things are, are separate from one another. In fact, science used to be called natural philosophy. You know, politics was seen as a philosophical pursuit, how to best relate in a society. In fact, did it ever occur to you why it is that today, if you get a terminal degree, meaning the most advanced possible degree in almost any field, what is that degree called? A PhD, a doctor of philosophy. 
Because virtually all of these things at one point were seen as being versions or brands or parts of the larger philosophical question. And so that's why the older philosophers, you know, back up until the Enlightenment, they were, were philosophers in a pure sense in terms of metaphysics and epistemology and stuff, but they were also scientists and they were also politicians because those things were seen as being interrelated to one another and not distinctive. Okay. Now, some of the key thoughts that John Locke came along, and John Locke specifically responded, almost everybody after Descartes, in some way or another responds to Descartes, just like everybody after Plato responds to Plato. Um, John Locke comes along and disagrees with Descartes. He says the, the point isn't what happens in your mind, the point is what exists in the real world. That it is all based upon sense experience. He said that there are only two aspects of life, and, and uh, David Hume will talk about this later. There are our sense experiences and then what we think about them. But those two things are related, and our thinking about them will never, we can't think about them until we experience them in the physical world. That's why he's an empiricist. Now, it was John Locke that created the idea of the tabula rasa. Anybody in education know what that means? The black tablet. Whereas Descartes and Augustine and Plato especially would have said that every human being has a priori, before any sense experience. We have basic things that are built in. Being a human being, we have basic things inside. For instance, the ability to perceive God. There's a modern philosophical view of that called Reformed Epistemology. But the idea that there are some things that are inherent in our understanding before any sense experience. You know, Plato, well, uh, the, so Locke says no, there is nothing that exists prior to sense experience. We are a blank slate, we are a blank tablet, and then everything we experience in our minds paints or draws or writes on that tablet. And so this obviously became a major influence on education, the philosophy of education. Now, um, knowledge and reality can only be pursued by the experience of the senses. All people are a blank slate at birth, and experience of the physical world is what changes them. He outlined, as I said, uh, theories of political rights and majority rule that became the basis of our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. And he applied empiricism, this idea of looking at the evidence of what exists in the physical world. He applied it to ethics, politics, religious belief. There was no hard barriers back then. In terms of long-term impact, he accepted Descartes' rationalism, that I have to think about things, that it is what I think about it. But he said, you don't start just the thinking. It doesn't start internally, it starts externally. It's not all in your mind, which is what idealism says. It is rather empirical. I believe what I see. Back to that Missouri reference. Show me. He founded uh, later radical skeptical views of existence. We're going to talk about David Hume in a minute. He's the most radical founder. Uh, he was pro-Aristotle, pro anti-Plato. So he falls on the Aristotle and Aquinas side. Whereas Descartes fell on the Plato and Augustine side. I'll show you that in a minute. And we can thank him for the foundations that became our U.S. form of government. I'll give you a quote from John Locke, or actually two quotes that are related. First, he said, Idea is the object of thinking. Every man being conscious to himself that he thinks it is past, that, that much he agreed with, with Descartes about. It is past doubt that men have in their minds several ideas, such as are those expressed by the words whiteness, hardness, sweetness, thinking, motion, man, elephant, army, drunkenness, and others. It is in the first place then to be inquired, how does one come by them? What can you say about all those descriptive words he's just listed there? Are they not all some physical characteristic? Remember, Locke is arguing that everything starts with something in the physical world, and then we think about it. And he goes on, all ideas come from sensation, which means experience things with your senses, or reflection, thinking about it, once you've sensed something. Let us then suppose the mind to be, as we say, white paper, void of all characters, without any ideas. How comes it to be furnished? Whence has it all the materials of reason and knowledge to this I answer in one word, from experience? In that all our knowledge is founded, in that all our knowledge is founded, and from that it ultimately derives itself. It's not something that exists in my head or in my faith before experiencing the world. Everything starts with the physical world, and 
everything I know, everything I experience, that all comes in and creates everything I am. So John Locke and Descartes completely disagreed with each other on that part. They both agreed you had to think about it. But where's the source of it? Descartes said it ultimately is all internal. Locke said it's all external. Make sense? All right, I now want to talk to you about the third philosopher today, who, David Hume, Scottish, before I was a Christian, my trinity was David Hume, Immanuel Kant, and G.F.W. Hegel. <laughs> okay? Um, Hume, Kant, and Hegel were the giants on whose shoulders I thought I was going to stand in order to figure out the meaning of, of life. Hume is, to, is one of the most influential thinkers for basic reasons that has ever lived. All of these people are very influential. But Hume especially, I think, we see reflected in a lot of modern thinking. Hume was a philosopher and an ethicist. He wrote extensively about how philosophy contributes to ethics. And ethics is one of the major branches of philosophy even today. He was a historian. In fact, in his lifetime, he wrote a five-volume history of England. And that's what made him famous. In his lifetime, he was no more as a, as a historian than as a philosopher. And it's also the thing that made him, gave him an income that he could live on. Um, and he was a political theorist and economist. Again, you know, these guys were doing all this stuff. They were not seeing themselves as just a political thinker or an economist or a scientist or a philosopher. Now, his key thoughts. Uh, Hume said that reason and sensation are separate things. All right? That uh, what, it, what we sense, that is, our, our physical senses, perceiving the world, and our reason are not the same. That is, he carries that to such an extent, that's called Hume's fork. The division of things into internal and external. The idea of what he calls sensation, which is the bringing in of input from the physical world and then ideas about those things as the two divide. And much of his philosophy is built on that division. He said, and this is the most important thing probably that he brought into the, the argument. He said there is no reasonable argument for causation. It's just a habitual way of thinking based on experience. Now, what does that mean? And why is that so important? If I walked over there and I flipped on on or off a light switch, what would happen? The lights would either come on or off, depending on whether they were on or off when I started. That's causation. For every effect, there is an equal and opposite, I mean, for every cause, there's an equal and opposite effect, meaning that, that you do something and there's a result. And, if you, if, and it's predictable. If every time I flipped on a light switch here, a house of Hokotepec might or might not blow up, what would that do to change the way I acted or thought about things? All that I do every day, everything I do is based upon the reliability of causation. That if I do something, I know what to expect to have happen. What Hume did was he said there is no rational proof or absolute argument that causation is always going to be the same. He said all you know is what happened last time or all the times before this, there is no philosophical, rational justification to say it's absolutely going to happen that way again next time. Now, even Hume said you couldn't live like that. <laughs> but he, and, and nobody has ever been able to refute that. And he used the example of a, a set of pool balls. Actually, they played billiards back then, but you know pool. If you hit a pool ball and it strikes another ball in a certain way, it will drive it off in one direction or another, right? And depending upon the spin that's on the ball, etc. Now, if you hit the cue ball in a certain way and it strikes another ball, an object ball, in a certain way, if it's exactly the same as the way it happened last time, then you expect the result to be the same, right? Cause and effect, cause and effect. Hume says you have no proof that that pool ball is not going to shoot straight up in the air, or it's not going to stay absolutely where it is and, and your cue ball is going to bounce off. He said you have a habitual experience of what's going to happen, but you can't prove it philosophically. For that reason, we have to be skeptical about projecting our past experience into any future expectation. Does that make sense? You can't prove the cause and effect is going to happen next time the way it happened last time. That introduced a radical philosophical skepticism that is at the core of much of what modern Western thinking is. In fact, one of the things that David Hume did was, one of, one of the major branches of philosophy is um, called epistemology. 
I, and this has been a special interest of mine. I once told a friend of mine, a woman that we, Carolyn and I, my wife and I worked with, that um, I was studying epistemology, and she said, I think my mom had that. <laughs> now, women, you'll have to explain to the men what that means later, okay? <laughs> anyway, episiology is not the same as epistemology. And so, epistemology is the philosophical inquiry into how we can know what is true. And with David Hume, the focus moved away from what we can know toward how we can know. And David Hume introduced a radical skepticism that said, you can't really know for sure at all. Which meant every philosopher, every thinker, and ultimately every person after that ended up having this sort of question. Well, do I really know? Can I really know? How do you know? Not what do you know, but how can you know? That's the difference between metaphysics is what is real. Epistemology is how do you know what is real? How do you know what is true, especially? And because David Hume's questioning of whether we can know or not for sure, epistemology has held philosophy captive for 300 years almost. Quite literally, every time somebody would come up either doing philosophy or doing almost anything, there would be some radical, skeptical follower of David Hume's lurking in the shadows saying, but how do you know? Well, we have it, but how do you know? You know what happened last time, how do you know what's going to happen next time? Can you imagine what that does to the thinking of a culture if we become, without being conscious of it, if we become embedded in this idea that you can never really know anything for sure? Right? This inherent skepticism and doubt and these are the seeds that eventually led, in, to some people, to nihilism. The fact you can't know. You can't, you can't know anything for sure. You can't know that something is true. So I give up. Despair. Nihilism. And this was where the seeds of that started. Now, David Hume, by all accounts, was a very gentle and generous man. He wasn't some dark, brooding sort of, uh, you know, bad guy. He took a walk every day at the same time and everyone said he was the most generous person in greeting people and he was very happy and everything was fine. So it's not like this sort of messed him up, but it, to a great extent I think it has seriously messed up a lot of people since then. And we'll talk about that as we go along with some of the other philosophers. It's also true that, that whereas Descartes had argued that a human being is identified by being a rational self, Hume said, no, you're not rational, you're just a bundle of perceptions that are all contradictory and all mixed up, and so you're not consistent at all. Human beings aren't consistent as rational beings, they're just, in fact, he said, they, uh, Hume comes along and says, rationality isn't really the point. Yes, you have to think about things, you have ideas that work on the perceptions that you have, but ultimately it is emotion, it is passion that drives people, not rationality. Yes, you have to think about something. The mind is important, but you don't, can't know for sure, and you are more driven by your passion than you are by your mind. And he went so far as to say, for instance, that this affects the ethics, because he was an ethicist as well. He said, the concept of right and wrong is not rational. You can't prove it. You can't whittle away all of the questions until all of the doubts that you might have to you get to the point to say, this is absolutely provable. That right and wrong, he said, was simply convention. It was a pragmatic or a practical attempt for people to create happiness for themselves, living with other people, but there's no philosophical argument that one thing necessarily has to be right and another thing wrong. This led to a lot of other philosophical directions, including in the 20th century, we saw a number of situations where people said, well, if I have the power to do something, that makes it right. There's no real such thing as right and wrong, it's just what I can do. Think Joseph Stalin, think Adolf Hitler. There is no right or wrong other than what I choose to do if I have the power to do it. Much of that first thinking like that came from David Hume. So, in terms of his long-term impact, he introduced radical skepticism into philosophy and epistemology. Remember, epistemology is how do you know? And he basically said, you don't know. And every time somebody since then has said, well, we believe metaphysically this is true, but how do you know? How do you know? How do you know? How can you be sure? How do you know? That is, while Hume 
brilliant. And what a huge, you know, one time a huge hero of mine. I now see all the damage that came from that. Um, he laid the foundation for every self-negating ideology that came in the 19th and 20th century, like nihilism, you know, like pragmatism, which basically says, if it works, it must be right. Um, and some of these were like pragmatism. You may think pragmatism just means being practical, but there is a philosophical school called pragmatism. We're going to talk about William James later on. He did, like John Locke, he contributed to a lot of economic theory. He influenced Adam Smith, another Scotsman, and influenced the development of modern capitalism. So, like John Locke, David Hume had a significant influence on how we understand Western culture today in Western Europe and in the United States. So, and, and by the way, when he talked about the fact that there are sensations and then there are ideas, and those two things are separate, he said, uh, he gave the, the analogy of the unicorn. Where in the world did we come up with the idea of a unicorn? If everything is just sensation or them thinking about that, nobody's ever really seen a unicorn, although I think I did once in Australia. I'll tell you that story later. Um, he said, okay, you've seen horses, you've had a sense experience of a horse, you've seen horned animals, you have the sense experience of horned animals. As you think about those things, those sensations that you experience, when you have ideas about those things, you begin to merge them together and you can come up with other creative things like a horse that you've experienced and a horned animal that you've experienced being a horned horse. But he said it's all sensation or ideas, those two forms, Hume's fork. Any questions about David Hume? What, what were his religious beliefs, if any? He was, he was an uh, avowed skeptic. Um, he specifically said he didn't believe, you know, in, in God, which was a radical thing for him to say. Uh, in fact, I think it was Hume that said, the best theologian I ever knew was a fishmonger's wife who, when I fell in a bog, and asked her to pull me out, she said she would do so only if I said I was a Christian and could recite the Lord's Prayer. He said, that's the best theologian I've ever heard of, because he thought it's purely a practical way of getting by. Kind of thing. Um, but he was a skeptic. His skepticism, even though apparently he was not an unhappy man. Now let me give you a, a quote from him, I'm giving you a quote from each of these philosophers. Hume, in an inquiry concerning human understanding, wrote, Reason can never show us the connection of one object with another that cause and effect. Though aided by experience and the observation of the conjunction in all past instances, you may have seen the same cause and effect happen 10,000 times, but that doesn't prove it's going to happen that way next time. When the mind therefore passes from the idea or the impression of one object to the idea or belief of another, it is not determined by reason, but by certain principles which associate together the ideas of these objects and unite them in the imagination. It's not a fact. It's not a predictable reality. It's your imagination. I hit a pool ball a certain way, and always in the past I connected that with the response of the other pool ball going this way. But those two things don't actually have any necessary relationship, is what he's saying right here. Cause and effect is not rationally provable. Next time, it could be completely different. And that's where radical skepticism is. Any other questions about David Hume? Yes? You said that uh, all of these people dabbled in politics and science and religion and so on. But what he says totally throws out of science and the experimental method. Well, he was not a scientist so much. He was, he was philosopher, ethicist, historian, politician. He, of all of these, was less involved in science, okay? Now, this is, last week I gave you this chart. Uh, uh, this is a simplified version. Some idealists that we know reality with our minds. Materialists, we know reality with our senses. We talked about Plato, whose ideas led to St. Augustine, that faith precedes reason. Uh, Aristotle, in materialism, led to Thomas Aquinas, reason precedes faith. Well, directly into the idealism school, you get René Descartes, the idea that it's all in your head, so to speak, that it is what you think about. I think, therefore I am. And he introduced both uh, subjectivism and this idea of rationalism. It's about thinking about things, and it's me. Then you 
get John Locke, who we were sponsored at Descartes, agreed with Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, and developed the, the principles of empiricism. That every, all knowledge, all reality that we can experience is based upon what we, our sense experiences. The empirical experience of the physical world, not anything before that. That we're white tablets, we're tabula rasa when we're born, and everything we are is based upon what we experience. And then you get David Hume, which is still primarily under the, the idea of the sense experience, but he introduces a radical skepticism and says you can't project anything in the future, you can only talk about what you experienced before. Every, every time you've seen A happen and then B result in the past, it doesn't matter if you've seen that 100,000 times, you can't promise that it's going to happen the same way next time. Still, he's talking about what's happening in the physical world as being most important. The sensations that you take in. And then you have ideas that happen inside that, that work with those, like creating a unicorn from your perceptions or your sensation of a horse and a horned animal. But there is nothing to prove. You know, this is Hume's fork. Those two things are separate. And it starts with sensation. You have to have sensation coming in. You have to have an experience in the material world before your mind can do anything with it in terms of ideas about it. You could not have created a unicorn in your mind if you've never had a sense experience of a horse and a horned animal. Yes? So, right now in the U.S. and a lot of the world, business people and commercial people seem to think that it doesn't matter what they sell as long as they make money. It doesn't matter if they're selling you poisonous food. It doesn't matter if they're selling you drugs that are giving you new diseases as long as they're making money. And it seems like it comes down to a lot of what you're just talking about. Right. They're like, well, I don't really know that. I'm not. I'm going to pretend that I don't know that right. it gives you this disease, as long as I make money. Well, these are the foundations. See, if you, if David, if David Hume were sitting here today and you use that analogy with him, he would be mortified because mm -hmm. he he was a moral man apparently, but um, he would be mortified by that idea because what you're describing that if you didn't hear her, she said. There are companies that are selling poisonous food and doing all sorts of things, and it doesn't matter as long as they make money. This is the commercialism idea. That's one of the isms I talked about, the idea that the profit margin, that the economic benefit, is as a philosophical system that that overrides everything else. What happens is, one by one, various things that these philosophers and others, and I'm not denigrating them, they were thinking people and they came up with some brilliant ideas. But over time, you know, between this period, David Hume being in the 18th century, and modern times, the accumulation of various things, subjectivism, it's what works for me. That became pragmatism under William James, logical positivism, etc., other things you'll hear about in the weeks ahead. It also became the, the idea of, of, of rationalism. You know, I can rationalize away almost anything. You know, I'm... I'm Yes, this food may be hurting people, but I'm employing 500 people and their families are taken care of because of this, all right? The idea that I can think things out and that overwhelms any feeling or any other, you know, that, that how I can rationalize it overwhelms any other kind of truth-seeking that I might do, like compassion or anything else. There are all sorts of pieces of that. And as we talk, as we go along, we're going to see a building block of these kinds of things as we, as we go through so that we'll understand how we've gotten to the place we're thinking, how we think about things today. That's, that's where we're getting to. We sort of have to take it a block at a time. Other questions? Yes? Did, did Hume attempt to incorporate probability in this philosophy? I did something 10,000 times, I got this result. Right. I may not get it on the 10,000 the first time, but I probably will. Well, I think David Hume would say, in fact, what he did say, is that based upon our habitual experiences, we expect certain things, which is another way of saying the probability of that. And so he would say, it is probable. But he would say, but you can't guarantee it. There is no rational justification for expecting that it must happen. And so that, that's all you need. That's sort of the principle of falsification. It will only take one time of that not happening to say, hey, you can't prove this anymore. And, and you would say, I have no reason to believe that the next time you experience something, even if it's worked the same way it caused the fact 10,000 times before, it may be different next time. And just that question, that possible falsification, is enough to raise the question, but how do you know it's going to be like that? And that's the skepticism that he introduced. How do you know? 
Well, as I say, that question has really held philosophy and a lot of other human culture in, in bondage, you know, uh, been held captive to that kind of thinking for 300 years. It's only been fairly recently that philosophers in, in the late 20th and early 21st century have begun to say, let's just forget about that for a while because, you know, it, it's a, it's a non-starter. And if we allow that to be the dominant thing, that every time somebody proposes a way of thinking about something, somebody says, but how do you know? You know, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're not getting anywhere. Nobody's gotten anywhere in 300 years because of that. So let's stop doing that. And there's been a lot of production, you know, a lot of productive thinking since then because of people's willingness to say, you may have been right, but let's just forget about it for a little while and, and think about some other things. Okay? It's taken us a long time to get there. Again, if you're interested, sorry that that heat is so light that uh, it's, in fact, I'm going to go back to the other one. Uh, the, the PowerPoint was assuming that I actually wanted, to commit, wanted that to be a, a website, you know, an accessible link. There you go. If you'd like to watch the video from last week or recommend this to anybody, the videos are under www.litchapala.org. It stands for Lakeside Institute of Theology, which is where we, but there's probably at this point almost 500 hours of lecture there from all the courses that we've done in the, the Institute of Theology, as well as all the lecture series I've done for the cruise ships and, uh, and here. So you can access any of that stuff. It's all available free of charge. And there are also copies of the PowerPoints so that you can go back and look at those slides if you want. Any last questions? Next week, we will pick up again, and let me remember where we're going next. Next week is experience. We are going to be talking about Immanuel Kant, who is probably Kant and Plato, maybe Descartes, but Kant and Plato are probably the two most important philosophers ever in Western history. Immanuel Kant fundamentally changed things, and interestingly, Kant was inspired in philosophy by David Hume. He didn't agree with him. But he said, David Hume awakened me from my philosophical slumber. In other words, Hume's ideas shook Kant up and made him work on his own philosophical ideas. So next week, The Nature of Experience, Immanuel Kant, and Friedrich Schleiermacher. I want you to all come back next week and be able to say Friedrich Schleiermacher. <laughs> uh, one of the early theologians, the first major liberal theologian, and he messed everything up. <laughs> as German theologians have sometimes done. All right, thank you all for coming, and I look forward to seeing you again next week.